But the minute that I had to shave my head because my hair was falling out so much that it, it was just pointless to have it there still. Um, I had my brother shave my head. And I, when I saw myself without the hair, that was a huge transition into this world that I didn't know before, this world of cancer patients, because we all have seen different experiences in people's lives. But when we're thrown into it, that's that's a different thing. Let's learn how our next guest gets up, dress up, and show up on purpose. Enjoy the episode. Hello, morning enthusiasts. Welcome to the Best Morning Routine Ever podcast. I am your host, Looney Lewis, and today I have the honor of bringing on a very special guest, and I mean, she is a woman of power. Once you hear her story, you'll know what I mean. I have the honor today of um, sitting with Joy Clausen Soto. She is a keynote speaker who inspires audience with her story of perseverance. She followed her dream to um, SeaWorld in San Diego to become a dolphin trainer. That's actually down the street from me. After that, Joy continued following her dreams and attended film school. Then at the age of 25, she found a lump on her throat and was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. Joy decided to make a documentary of her journey with the hope of sharing a story of survival. Her documentary, Just One Year, A Story of Triumph Over Cancer, went viral. It went off to win several awards at film festivals. And she has been on ABC. She has been on all the platforms and all the channels just talking about her inspiring story, how she overcame that and followed her dream. So with no further ado, Joy, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I am thrilled. I'm elated. Thank you for the opportunity. Now, man, your story, um, having to live your dream and then getting diagnosed. Before we dive into the, the details of that, tell us a little bit about you, your background. My background, well, I was going to school in uh, Hawaii and I was getting a degree in psychology and I realized that I wasn't cut out to work with people, <laughs> which sounds <laughs> kind of funny, but you know, I just wasn't. And so I thought, what, what else can I do with this? And then I realized that I've always loved the ocean and I love animals and I've seen people work with animals before with dolphins. And I thought it was a dream job, but I never thought that was something that I could do. Um, but apparently that is actually the best degree to have to get into animal training. So I started pursuing that. And then I started volunteering and interning, not getting paid, working a second job to just pay for the job that <laughs> I was working where do. I wasn't getting paid. Yeah. And then I finally got my first paying job in Hawaii. And then I went on to get, a, to start working at SeaWorld San Diego eventually. So it was a dream come true to start working there. Yeah. San Diego is beautiful. That's currently where I reside. So you got to work with Shamu, right? You got to work with the, the that's no, not, not the, with Shamu, not with the killer whales, but I worked with dolphins. Okay. So how, what's that yeah. like? It's incredible because you build a relationship up with them and, and each animal is a little bit different. Just like us, we have different personalities as humans. They have different personalities. So some of them are really fast learners. Others were a little bit slower. Um, some loved different types of reinforcement. Like, I mean, obviously they love fish, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be obvious, but some of them loved ice more than anything. So if they did something that I wanted to say, yeah, that was great. Good job. Then I would just get a, this bucket ready before the session of ice. And then the minute they came back from doing something and I want to make an impact on them, I would just dump this big bucket of ice into the water. And I just love the way this animal, I'm getting chills just thinking of it, <laughs> but I would just, uh, this animal would come back and just start munching on the ice and just vocalizing at the same time, just super excited. Um, so it was really incredible to work with them and to get to know those different personalities. Yeah, just like uh, just like humans, they have their personalities, but positive mm -hmm. reinforcement works. So psychology did come in handy for you. <laughs> it did. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's interesting. And so from working out to San Diego, you're um, enjoying it, loving the the um, working with dolphins. And then you got this um, diagnosis. Tell us about that. What was was it like earth shattering? 
Well, there is a little part in between. I had decided to go to film school because as I was working at my dream job, I started thinking about filmmaking and I go home and start editing things. And so I actually ended up leaving SeaWorld San Diego to go to film school in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I was there for just a few months. And then on Thanksgiving, I remember I'd been really tired and coughing and the cough kept getting worse and worse instead of better. And finally, I walked into my uncle's house on Thanksgiving and I put my hand on my throat after I coughed. And that's when I felt that there was a lump there. And I remember just feeling the blood drain from my face. I ran to the bathroom just to check it out. And sure enough, there's a lump that I had never noticed that was there. And then my uncle took me to urgent care. And that night, the doctor, um, you know, basically told me that something was really wrong and I need to go to another doctor on Monday. And by the following week, I was diagnosed with large B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and, and it was stage two. So the reason why I had been coughing was because it was behind my lungs and around my heart. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and within that, everything changed within a week. Within a week, yes, everything changed. So every, my life, my, you know, you think you have one direction in life and this is what you're going to do. And then you know, things happen that just change. Like this pandemic has changed a lot for a lot of people. And for me, that's that was a big change in my life. I thought I was going to become a filmmaker. And then I had different plans at that point. Wow. Yeah, that is devastating. And so going through that, had to go through chemo, chemo and you're cancer free now. So walk us through that process. Yeah. Well, when I, because I was going to film school, I actually tried to continue going to film school, but they said no to me because I said, I can't do everything because I'll be too tired from the chemotherapy. And they basically said no. So I decided to make a documentary on myself because that way I could still learn about filmmaking. And I really wanted to show a story of survival. I mean, obviously that, that was my hope, but at that point, that's all I saw were just stories where people weren't surviving. So I wanted to like get that story out there. And that was really important to me. So when film school said no, that, that's one of the things I've learned in life is that just because someone says no or a door is closed, that doesn't mean it's the end. It's up to you to figure out another way around. And so that was my workaround was make a docu documentary on myself, still learn by doing that. And then um, I started working on that and it, it took me a while, but I got it out in, I think it's 2008 that I uh, went to film festivals with a documentary. And at that point I went back to SeaWorld and I was um, working there and I actually started a program for kids who have cancer at SeaWorld. Wow. Wow. That is a very um, touching story. And I love that you wanted to bring out a survival story and you got that survival story out and that's you taking that you pivoting, right? That's what I love. I hear that yes. perseverance piece of it. You pivot because one door was closed and they said, no, you didn't just accept it and wallow in that. You said, you know what? I need to find another door. Oh, I'm going to create it. And that's exactly what you did, right? One door closes, you created another one and opened an, a new opportunity. And not only you touched lives over the years with the story, but you, it, it's won several awards. Yes, absolutely. And another thing was I started a pro that program, like I said, at SeaWorld, but there was a reason for that because I had this idea of um, getting together with this roommate that I had because I was treated at a children's hospital. So I had this roommate and she had cancer. And I just imagine us both being able to get into the water when we were healthy and we had hair and that didn't end up being able to happen. And so I remember talking. It's like when we get our ideas out to people and talk, sometimes you get back the information you need because I was telling my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, that I really had this dream of getting my roommate in there and it's not going to work out anymore. And he said, well, why does it have that dream have to go away? Why can't you just make it into something bigger where it can affect more kids with cancer? And so that's when we came up with the idea of having an annual event at SeaWorld for kids with cancer from Rady Children's Hospital in Children's Hospital Los Angeles, where they can come to the park and get in the water to meet a dolphin. So that was just a really, really cool part of the whole thing. So I, I think that whenever we get redirected in life, it's just uh, it's just kind of pointing us more towards our purpose, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it leads you to back to the truth. It, it really, it's supposed to happen. That 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 um, serenity that comes with you are at the right place at the right time. You are surrounded by the right people. It's on, it's only a, a, a step towards where you should be, where you belong, and that that kind of brings peace. It gives me chills to think about that. Like we fuss and worry about things too much. <laughs> we do, yeah. 
Well, because we think it's supposed to be a certain way and we think it's a certain path and this is what the path looks like, but everyone's path is different. And you get, I mean, even Oprah, I love the story about how Oprah was a news anchor and then um, she got fired from that job, but they gave her a hosting job, like a, you know, a talk show host job. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I mean, oh my gosh, what an incredible redirection. So right. it's, I really feel like it's life telling you you're supposed to go in a different direction and just, you need to listen to it and not give up. That's the thing is don't ever give up. Just keep going, keep trying. And being obedient and listening to that voice. It, it's imperative to, to, to um, that instinct, that intuition, because it's a small, still yes. quiet voice at times. And it can be loud, you know, outside. Um, noises can can be so loud that you don't hear it. How have you been able to stay obedient? Because it really is your story has helped and how allow you to serve um, tons, tons and tons of kids um, with that, giving them hope and inspiration um, in the process and being a, a survivor yourself. How can one begin to to har harness that perseverance and start listening? What can someone do to to be obedient to that still quiet voice? I think, like I said, it's just, just not giving up when you are faced with that. I, I think we all get, you know, upset when things aren't going our way. I am certainly not someone who's just like, yeah, let's do it. Go, go, go. I will, you know, have a setback and then I'm, you know, lying down for three days, <laughs> like, I figure out what to do next. But, but it's the matter of, okay, just get back up and just keep going and visualize where you want to go. That's so important visualization has helped me out so much in my life. It's how I passed the swim test. I couldn't pass the swim test a day before I went there for, to SeaWorld. It's a you know, 120 feet underwater with one breath of air, 26 feet down to the bottom and a lot of other things, but I couldn't do it. And the only, only way I was able to do it is by visualizing. And so the whole plane ride over, I had less than 24 hours to be able to be able to take this test and the plane ride over, I just visualized the whole time. So I feel like visualization, uh, is such a huge part of life and visualize where you want to go and what that looks like and and then start making those steps to get there. Yeah, well put. The manifestation, you got to see it in the mind. I think Dwayne Dyer, Dwayne Dyer said, Dr. Dyer said, you know, people will tell you, you have to believe it to see it. You have to see it to believe it, but it's the other way around. You have to believe it. You have to manifest it. You have to visualize it. You have to see it in your mind and then you can see it in fruition in reality Absolutely. because it, things are created twice first in the mind and then in reality right oh yeah absolutely and then you can almost see okay well this is a problem i might run into and this is how i can fix it and this is how i can avoid the problem or if you encounter the problem then you just know it's going to happen instead of letting that be a huge setback in your life yeah yeah no that that is well put another thing you mentioned is if you do get a setback it knocks you off your feet for a couple of days i've experienced that it's almost like a boxing match right you're you're, you're fighting especially being an entrepreneur and and creating your own opportunities you get knocked and you you just you have you're winded you got nothing left to give and so you take a couple of days off you take a couple of hours off but you don't give up you get back right. up however long it takes you you get back up and figure out another way and what i find what works for me um joy so much is doing those downtime it's not wasted time there is um thinking happening there's processing happening mm -hmm. it's like okay what failed what didn't work okay how can i do it better or simply sometimes it's just being still and not even thinking about anything much because you kind of need to to grasp it's almost like a reality check mm -hmm. it, it's a it, when it does knock you out as you say being perseverance is really just okay get being able to get back up so it's well set on your end now i'm curious um and i i have um want to talk about losing your hair doing chemo what does that do to the self especially as a woman that was the hardest part initially when I was going through it because I, when I first found out I had cancer is one thing. And then I started going through the chemotherapy and I still had my hair and it just felt like I was sick, but I wasn't that sick. And I remember I talked to, you know, I talked to anyone, you know, the person at the checkout counter, well, you know, I have cancer. <laughs> like, I don't know what was wrong with me, but I would just, I would just tell people that. And they're like, oh, you look great. I said, I know I feel great. I don't know why I'm sick. But the minute that I had to shave my head because my hair was falling out so much that it, it was just pointless to have it there still. Um, I had my brother shave my head and I, when I saw myself without the hair, that was a huge transition into this world that I didn't know before, this world of cancer patients, because we all have seen different experiences in people's lives 
but when we're thrown into it, that's, that's a different thing. And that, I think that's why I'm able to now be in this place where I can find ways to give back and to help people who are going through it because I've been touched by that, but it was very difficult. That was a, a gut punch when I was, when I saw myself with no hair, I remember I was actually being filmed by the way, if you want to see this, I have a TEDx. <laughs> I have a TEDx and that in my TEDx. So for Joy Claus and Soto TEDx, if you look, watch it, there's actually that one section of me when my brother was shaving my head in, in the TEDx. So if you want to see that part, you can. But I remember I was actually trying to smile the entire time because I was making a documentary. And so I imagined myself being really strong. And I was like, I was going to be like G.I. Jane, you know, in that movie where she's shaving her own head and there's cool music playing in the background. But then it wasn't like that. My brother shaved my head and I was devastated when I saw myself without hair because it's an identity, Yeah, you know, that I've always had. I think most of us have always had and to not have that all of a sudden, it's, it's almost a loss of identity in a sense. Yeah. And then having to, to cope with that, um, you, you, you're now being more compassionate, right? Because now you understand a whole different population. You understand everyone else. And because mm-hmm. you are now part of it. So it build that, that resiliency, I imagine, for you. Yes, absolutely. I, I, like I said, I think, it's, I think we go through these things that are difficult in our lives, but that's the most important thing to get out of it is to move, to be able to continue on and to find a way to give back to other people who then go through, through that same experience. Yeah. And so that's what I'm doing. And that's, I, I can't let go of it because I did the documentary. I did a TEDx. And now I just uh, published my book, Joy, a story of a dolphin trainer, filmmaker and cancer survivor, because I want to share the parts that I couldn't share in the documentary, like just, just everything from beginning to end. And when I met my husband and, you know, because when you go through cancer, I think uh, people don't realize that after you find out that you're cancer free, it's actually not easy still. Uh, you're not on easy street because you're still worried about it and you've been through a lot. And so I took a while to get back on my feet after finding out I was cancer free. So I have everything like that in my book, just talking about it. And I've had other people who have had cancer read it and say it's like reading their own story. So I'm I'm happy to have gotten that out and to share that with the world. Yes, yes, that was my next point is um, a little bit about your book and some some takeaways um, for people who are going to pick it up. What are some of the things that really stuck out um, that can really stick, stick out to them? One of the biggest things for me was gratitude. I, I had listened to this motivational speaker named Zig Ziglar a couple of years before I got sick. Have you heard of Zig Ziglar? I know Zig Ziglar. Yeah, very well. You know Zig Ziglar? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, oh, I want to hear. How do you know him? No. So I've heard, I've listened to his stuff since, uh, yes. what, 2000, uh, 1995. I've been listening to Zig Ziglar and, and Jim Rohn and Les Brown and all his yes. stuff. <laughs> okay, great. Well, that's fantastic. That's exactly what happened? I, I was listening to him around that time, maybe a couple of years later, but I picked up a tape of his and I go for walks and listen to uh, his tape. And it's funny because he, uh, the only reason why I picked up his tape was because I had to hear what someone named Zig Ziglar sounded like, because who's this guy with that <laughs> name? <laughs> and I loved his storytelling and how he was able to get through a message with his really interesting stories. And there was a story of him being stuck in an airport and having his flight be canceled. And instead of him being upset or angry, like most of us would be, he said, fantastic, when someone told him that his flight had been canceled. (laughs) And the lady behind the counter said, I just told you your flight's been canceled. Why are you saying fantastic? He said, well, I figure there's one of three reasons why that flight isn't taking off. One, there's something wrong with that plane. Two, there's something wrong with the people flying that plane. (laughs) Three, there's something wrong with the weather that flight will be taking off in. If that's the case, I don't want to be up there. I want to be right down here. Fantastic. I know. <laughs> so that story, when I heard it, it, it just really made me realize, wow, I really do have control over how I respond to a situation. I don't have to be upset when something happens. I have a choice. Yeah. And so uh, there was one point when I was sick and I was really upset and angry because I had a loved one. I loved one. He was a boyfriend. Okay. I had a boyfriend who just left me the second he heard out, I heard that I had cancer yeah. and then I finally got a hold of him and I said, hi, it's joy. And he hung up the phone on me. And so if you can imagine, I had a lot of anger in me at that moment in time. And that's when I remembered Zig's words 
of, of how, how he's in the airport and how he turned it around. And so I knew I had to stop what I was doing because I was so angry. I knew it was bad for me. So I said, if he could do that in the airport with his flight being canceled, I can do that with cancer. And I started thinking of all of the reasons why it was good that I've been diagnosed with cancer. And from that point on, I started treating everything with gratitude. It doesn't mean I was perfect. It doesn't mean I was going, yay, I have cancer. But I was looking at all of my blessings I had in life, like my friends and family who were there. And if you look hard enough, you will find those blessings. So I'd say that's the biggest takeaway from the book is to look for the blessings in your life and to be grateful. Yes. Attitude of gratitude. My God, it's powerful. (laughs) It is. Yeah. It's powerful. It can change your altitude. It can change the way you think. And then and it puts you in control again uh, of your surrounding, of yourself. Because if you can control your mind, you can control your thoughts, you can control your outside, right? I think it's Jim Rohn that says you um, change. If you change, everything will change for you. Um, okay. Yes, yes along that same line. So that's phenomenal. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing book. Now, if tell me about the things that you do, and I'm sure gratitude is part of it for your morning routine, right? Tell us how do you get up, dress up and show up? Well, I have to say that I try to do these things. So I'm going to tell you what I do, but I do have two young kids and one goes to sleep really late. She likes to read off into the night, (laughs) even though I ask her to go to sleep. And then my son wakes up super early in the morning. So what I try to do every morning is I try to have a cup of water or I I like coffee, but I I gotta tell you, my body doesn't react well to it. So (laughs) I'm trying to cut out coffee now, but I will um, just try to go outside and just enjoy the nature because I have this big tree in my backyard and I can hear the birds and everything. So I just take about 10, 15 minutes to myself. Uh, I'll visualize what I want for the day. And then even before that, the night before, I like to plan my day and uh, make sure I write everything down so I don't forget because I know the day of I will forget so I have to write a list or put it in my phone what I want to do and I also this is going to sound silly but I need to do the dishes and <laughs> clean up a little bit because if not I feel like I've started behind already for the day so if I get all that stuff done and then I'm ready to take on the day in the morning by you know planning ahead and taking that moment to myself and to just I like to visualize what I want out of life because I feel like if you don't have a, a goal a destination then you're just kind of wandering around so I try to just think about that goal and that destination every single day yeah on the line of Zig Ziglar he also says that you can't hit a target you don't have <laughs> I, I am so happy I'm talking to you right now <laughs> right you gotta yes. have an aim you gotta have a goal you gotta know where you're going and so visualization is a, a good way to create again right that's like you creating that opportunity that you did when they turned you down in film school creating that mm-hmm. opportunity you you do that by visualizing you do that by picturing it um in your mind and what you want it to look like because we we do the opposite 95 percent of the time we think about things going away. We think about we think about things going wrong. We think about mm-hmm. things I'm falling apart. We think about people hurting us and being angry, being upset, and what's happening. We're feeding that monster, so it grows, mm-hmm. and then we attract more of it in our life. We attract it more, and that's all we see. That's all we get. But if it's the opposite, where you're visualizing, you're grateful, you're gonna bring more things to be thankful for. You're gonna bring the things you actually do want into your reality. It's yes. because the brain doesn't know the difference. Yes, isn't that crazy? I yes, absolutely. Does not know the difference. Yeah, so I I really um like the the visualization piece of it, and you you said it so you uh, in a subtle way, Joy, that the morning routine starts the night before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause you got to prepare for the next day. You got to do the dishes. I'm the same way. My husband and I, we always go back and forth. And so I had to, I take it on myself to do the dishes and clean because I'm, I'm up at 4 a.m. I want to wake up and it's a clean house. I'm ready to go. And I, right. I want to focus because when you, when we wake up, the first hour is out, we are out prime and we don't mm-hmm. want to get decision fatigue. We're going to spend the time in mundane things like doing dishes, picking up toys, because then we want to use it for things that are critical because the mind is susceptible. It's receptive. And you don't want to do things that are not going to enrich your mind, like doing mm-hmm. dishes. So I like myself, just like you like to do it the night before. And so it's imperative to start to plan the day before so that tomorrow when you get up, you're just ready to go, like putting the, the water on your nightstand before you go to bed. So it's easy. Mm-hmm. First thing in the morning, you really, truly got a plan. I'm like, I'm glad you said that because you got to prime your environment. That's what is so important for you. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to hear you echo that back. That's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Other people need to do that too. <laughs> we, yeah, everyone is doing that. It's imperative to, to set that, that tone for sure. So mm -hmm. um, tell us, how can we connect with you? Where can we find your book um, and your documentary? Oh, my book is on Amazon and my documentary, I just, this past year, I ended up loading it onto YouTube because I just wanted people to have access to it. So if you actually looked at my documentary on YouTube, it's there. So it's um, Joy, the story of a dolphin trainer, filmmaker, and cancer survivor. You could also watch my TEDx. It has parts of the documentary in there. Uh, um, and yes, my book is, like I said, Joy, the story of a dolphin trainer, filmmaker, and cancer survivor. It's on Amazon. It has a ton of great reviews. Um, and the, the thing is, I really want it to help people. And so I self-published my book because I'm a crazy go get I'm not really a crazy go getter but I just <laughs> I just really want this to get out I want my story to be able to help people because I like I said my life hasn't been perfect I've had a struggle and push to get through and so this is my story of struggling and pushing to get through and making like these these things happen and now I have this wonderful husband and these two wonderful kids and um and I started out with a, a boyfriend who left me when I found out I was cancer I had cancer so <laughs> Such you know, things can change. Such a yeah, but it's on Amazon. Yes, it's such a blessing, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful how it all works out because he wasn't there. He wasn't the one. So now you are with the, the, the right people. So I'm really excited. Yes, I will definitely share that. What about your social media handles? My social media handles are, um, I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't, I don't have them right now. I'm sorry, okay. but I'm on LinkedIn. So if you look up Joy Klaus and Soto on LinkedIn, I'm there and I have a, you know, a picture of me speaking on TEDx and I would love to connect with you there. I have uh, about 4,000 followers and I love communicating with people. I'm very active on LinkedIn. That's phenomenal. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing and coming on to tell us your story. It's truly inspiring and perseverance, persevere, persevere, persevere. And make when one door closes, um, what I gather, Joy, when door closes, create another one. You know, make, make another door, mm -hmm. make a create your own opportunity. And I'm really glad we were able to um, see that through your story. So I thank you so much for joining us and being part of this show today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great talking to you. Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please comment and tell us what was your favorite part, your favorite habit that you are going to try out for yourself today. Comment below. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. Until next time, I will see you at the top of your best morning routine ever. Stay blessed.